Hi there and welcome back to another video of JPlay. I am Marcus and today I will walk you through a couple of rounds of Magidix, a game that has recently launched on Kickstarter. It has been designed by Norbert Kiss and will be published by A Games, the guys behind Avaroma, which I really liked a lot and was also pretty successfully on Kickstarter. And of course, you will find a link to the campaign in the description of this video. In Magitix, two to four players will lead four to eight heroes into a long lost temple of the Kingdom of Atherstem, aka the Kingdom of Light, in, yeah, in case you wondered, in order to find valuable treasures and mighty artifacts. So basically, each player will control two heroes from different factions who all try to defeat the other players in yeah, an arena-like battle to gain the most victory points. And that's a pretty mean thing. As you get more victory points, the more you hurt the other heroes. So <laughs> that's definitely not a multiplayer solo Euro game, but a tough player versus player experience, and which I happen to enjoy a lot, actually. At the end of round six, you tally up your score and see who dominates the Temple of Atherstem. But most likely the game will end earlier than that. And yeah, that's pretty much depending on how cruel things get around the temple. Here, I already prepared the battlefield and note that all you see here are prototype components. So the final product will definitely look more polished, even though a lot of the artwork already looks pretty nice. The temple itself may and most likely will look differently each time you play the game. And it scales pretty well as you are using temple tiles based on the number of players. And today I will demo a three player game, but I think the game works pretty well with only two player. Even though the rules suggest an even more aggressive variant, the so-called Mortal Kombat. Sub-Zero wins. No, just kidding here, of course. The blue player will play Prince Argon and Priestess Ilarin. They are both from the Kingdom of Light, so they are pretty much the former owners, owners of this temple. The yellow player will play as Aera, the sharpshooter, and Jael, the adventurer, and they are from the Space Banders faction. And in the green corner, we have Drachanakal, the shaman, and Ballisto, the rifleman, and they are both from the people of Mountain Deep. Each of the heroes comes with a totally unique special ability. Like Trachana Kal here, he is a shaman, so he's someone who gets to get more magical power if he decides to do so. And this can be pretty powerful because they're really great magic cards out there, which yeah, really helps you a lot against tanks like Argon the Prince, who basically has an yeah, auto shield always when he gets attacked. I randomly determined the player order and I also have populated the heroes in the temple. And the same is also true for building the temple. You do that in the player order, you start with this base here, then the first player gets to add tile and so on, then the other players do the same. And after you placed your first hero, you do everything anti-clockwise, basically the last player gets to place his second hero first and so on until all heroes are being spawned into the temple. There are some placement rules, but I will not go into detail there, but it works pretty well. Each player starts the game with three of those magic cards. Of course, they're hidden from the other players and I will not go into detail because all those magic cards are also unique in this game. So you really have a huge pile of those magic cards and yes, they're all unique. But of course, I will explain the effects once we play them. Each player gets one of those crystal cards, which you can use once during your round. You get two of those activation stones. This pretty much shows which of your heroes already have taken taken a turn, you get one of those overview cards and the action stones in your color and you place them basically like this. You always start with seven of those action points. This can go up, this can go down throughout the game, but normally seven is your number. It's also marked here on this summary card as well. And that's pretty much it. Of course, we must not forget the item cards and the corresponding prize and or reward tokens. We draw them randomly and each of those, yeah, item cards is in a stack of four but it's also basically determining a random order of those things so right now everything that's on top of this can be acquired through one way or the other but i guess i will also explain that to you when we get there 
Blue is the starting player and both of his heroes are basically in the northern part of the temple here. So we have Argon and we have Elarin and here we already have a slight problem with the game because there are no real counters or color I don't know frames for those it would be cool if you would place them in a blue surrounding frame or something like that then you would easily determine which hero belongs to whom but I think this is definitely something they may be able to fix but for now keep in mind those two heroes belong to the blue player we can now decide with which heroes we want to start and I think I want to start with Prince Argon here so I take one of those action markers and place it on top of him to show okay this is now the active player once we activate and we just put this on him so this shows everyone this character has already been used. Now Argon can do a lot of things. He can attack, he can use magic, he can use a hero unique ability but he doesn't have a unique ability. He has basically a reaction effect that's more or less always used so he doesn't have to spend points for that. He can walk and yeah he can do a redeem action i come to that in a second and he can trade items like this and you can always let's say draw more magic cards by spending action points to do so in the temple there are various spaces and especially around argon now here we have two pillars and they both block line of sight you see that here by this i symbol and this x and you can also not move on to that. Here we have one of those so-called magic spaces. This is a space where those loot tokens appear normally at the end of the round. And this is something that you normally want to collect, especially this one here, which is a magic stone. And particularly this one offers you an additional action point. So this is definitely a useful thing to do. So I think the first thing that Argon wants to do is to move onto this space in order to grab this artifact here. So let's move over to his summary sheet and let's see what the movement row shows. So the first movement, so he now wants to do a movement. So he moves his little action stone on the first space. The cost in order to use this space is printed below. So right now the first movement point doesn't cost him any action points at all, which is a good thing. So he can easily move onto this space and this already ends his movement, but he's allowed to keep this magic stone, which he can attach to the left side of his character board. So normally you are allowed to hold up to three of those magic stones. There are great ways to do that on the right side too but therefore you need to attach those to an item here. So first of all you need to acquire an item, assign it to your hero and then here on the right hand side you see another slot where you can keep another magic stone but this magic stone is then tied to this particular item and for the rest of the game basically. As we just got this magic stone that gives us an additional action point, we can trigger that right away. So we move one space up here and then it's still the turn of Argon. So he can basically go on until he has either spent all of his action points or until he more or less calls it a day and passes. But right now he's pretty exposed here and I think this is a pretty good spot here because yeah here he's basically blocked so line of sight is blocked because of this pillar here he's in theory also already blocked but i think this would be a pretty good spot to move to therefore he needs to do an additional movement action and now you see the next movement action costs actually one action point the next one would be two and three and so on so let's spend this action point here and then let's move him there and now i think maybe it should be even better to move him to this space there so therefore he will do another move action and now he has to spend two action points for that one and two and this allows him to move an additional space. He's still not done yet. He still has five more action points. And I think he wants to invoke a spell. So he will not do a magic action. This costs him four. There's a little three below that. And this means you can, let's say, spend 
fewer magic points if you're casting a spell that basically belongs to your school or whatnot. But in this case, I think this is not what he will do. So he will do this. This costs him one, two, three, four action points. And with those, he will cast Demonic Gift here. This is an instant effect, basically. So you play it, you resolve it, then it's discarded. And this gives you basically an additional loot token. For one magic point, you get one loot token and basically for yeah, second or more, you get additional loot tokens. That can be pretty powerful. Unfortunately, Prince Argen only has one magic point. You can improve your spells by discarding cards that either belong to the same school of the yeah, spell you just casted or by cards that belong to your school. Right now he doesn't have those cards, so he cannot increase the power of this effect. So it's pretty much one magic point. But this is still not bad because this allows him to grab one of those loot tokens here. And I will do that totally random. So this is it. And here he found a scroll pretty much which allows him to draw two magic cards. You can have as many of those one-time usage loot tokens as you want, but normally you really try to use them as quickly as possible. Of course, they do have to make sense. And I think in this case, it could already make sense because in order to spend this or use this loot token here, there's this little symbol here. This is the redeem action symbol. And the first time you're using this action, this is this one here. It's also free of charge or free of action points pretty much so he can do that right away so he will discard this token here and this gives him one two additional magic cards not a bad round for him he still has one more action point left but i think he will pass on this so we can basically reset this track here because this will be used by his second hero so he we will place the action token on Argon so we know he already has been activated this round but as he left one or more action points behind this means the next hero to activate for him gets an bonus action point. This can be the same hero in the next round in theory, but in this case it will definitely be Ilarin because she hasn't been activated yet. So she will also start her next turn with eight action points instead of seven. Then it's the yellow player and here it's down in the south basically. So we're here with Aira and here we have Jarl. Normally I would say, hmm, let's start with Aira. But I think in this case, maybe not. Maybe I want to start with Jarl first. Yeah, let's do that. So let's yeah, activate him. And I'm really thinking of grabbing this magic stone here. Normally Trahanal, Trahanakal is next to it. So he thinks, hey, I'm pretty sure I will get that. But he or his special ability allows him to move pretty fast. So I think in this case, it may be a good idea to leverage him. Yeah, why not? So he will spend his first action. Keep in mind, the first movement is always free and this allows him to move one space ahead. Of course, he could also go for this loot token here. It's okay because it allows you to grab some magic cards, but magic stones are way cooler than that. So his next action will be to move again. Normally, this would cost him one action point, but because he's such a swift guy he gets a discount on his movements basically he saves one action point so again the second step also didn't cost him any action points whatsoever so this lets him move there and then he only needs one more step to move into that space normally this would cost him two but because of his discount this only costs him one action point and this allows him to grab this stone of protection here basically. So let's assign this defense stone here. So he's now protected. The problem is you always get at least always one damage point. So with this stone, there's not a chance to 
ignore all the wounds because a lot of those heroes only have one damage point when they do attack and this would really break the game but for heroes that do two or more damage points this is definitely a great help for him but he still has six more action points left so i think he can still attack Trachanakal, who is now next to him looking pretty afraid to be honest so yeah let's do an attack that's pretty much the first row here so the first yeah, a round of combat costs him three action points, one, two, and three. Unfortunately, doesn't get any discounts for that. Then we check how much damage he does each time he uh, basically fights. In this case, this, these are two points worth of damage. And this means we just seen our first plot in Magitix. Pretty fast, huh? He still has three more action points and I think I want to move him out a little bit. So I want to move him again. Again, he gets his discount. So now one, two action points. Good thing is he left one action point behind for Aira when she gets activated. And with his movement, he wants to move in here a little bit away from the others, but still staying close to Trahanakal because his damage isn't that great. That was the activation for Jael. Now we come to the green player who placed his two heroes, let's say, far away from each other. Not sure if that's a bad thing, but that's the way how I did it. He's pretty pissed because he was really hoping for this cool item there to give him some protection. But yeah, Jael took it away from him under his nose. So I think I think I want to start with Trahanakal now. So let's place his action marker accordingly. And I think the very first thing he wants to do is to invoke a spell. That's pretty expensive. So one, two, three, four action points he has to spend because he wants to cast a spell that's outside of his school and therefore he will cast brilliance. This is a card that remains in play. It has a certain amount of charges. You see this little axe here. An axe is dependent on your magical spell. But before we can basically use this one, we have also an instant effect. And this tells me that I can heal the active hero right now, Trahan Nakal. And I heal that many yeah, life points as I have magical power. Trahanakal has a magic power of two, which is great to raise so he can heal both of his wounds now. And on top of that, he can now place two charges onto this card. Brilliance pretty much helps you or you or your allies in order to not get attacked by someone that re requires line of sight. So this can be pretty powerful. And yeah, we can basically use that anytime as it is a reaction effect. So I can choose when I want to spend one of those charges here. As he wasn't able to get a loot token this round, I think he wants to use his crystal cut. Now again, we see this little redeem icon here. So we have to do a redeem action. First action is free. And now we have to flip this crystal card. But of course we get to choose which of the actions we want to take. So we get more action points, we can heal. But this one is now the one that we are looking for. So we are allowed to draw two loot tokens and then we have to discard one. So let's flip this crystal card so we can use it only once per round. So any of those active heroes can use that. And then we will draw two of those tokens, one and two. And here he was kind of lucky. He drew two of those magic stones that give you more attack points, basically. So that's a pretty cool thing. So he will definitely go for one of those. He will attach it to his hero. So he does one more point of damage now. And I think then he will also attack. So he will spend one, two, three action points in order to do a melee action or melee combat action here. So he will target Jael here. Normally he would get two wounds, but because he has this armor stone here, he only gets one wound. But overall, that's still not bad. Trahanakal is now out of action points and I think there are not really cool things he want to do. Or should he? Huh, now I'm not so sure. Maybe he should move closer to Era because he has now two attack points. Yeah, why not do that? His first, or he's still doing his first movement action so he can move one space for free basically. 
So in theory, we would move this one, but it doesn't matter. This ends his turn because yeah, now he cannot do anything else. And then it's back to Ellerin or to the blue player. Now he has to activate Ellerin because Argen left her one action point behind. She now starts the round with eight action points. That's a very good thing. She can still use the crystal card. This is also cool. And yeah, let's see what she will do. But I guess this is a no brainer. She will do a move action and this lets her move onto this magic space. So she's now allowed to grab this magic stone, which she will attach. And now she has three magical power instead of only two. And this is really extremely, extremely powerful. And then she will move again. So she will have to spend one action point for that. And this lets her move one space ahead. And I'm doing this with a plan. Next, she will also cast a spell so she has to spend one two three four action points yeah unfortunately it's not a spell from her school but this is not that bad because she will cast the snowstorm all heroes and this really means all heroes in line of sight now gain wound equal to her magical power right now that's three but she can power up her spell by discarding a spell card that either shows this symbol here or shows this symbol here. So right now she will then discard this spell on top of this. So in total, she now has four magical power and now line of sight is important. Her ally Argen is protected by this column here. So normally you draw a line from center to center. You see this little dot split print here. Maybe you don't, but there are little dots in the center of those spaces. So he is protected. Ballisto down there is not protected. So he gets four wounds. This is really, really huge. Jael here is also not protected. Again, you do that from line to line. So we'll definitely cross through here. So this only blocks movement, but not line of sight. So he also takes four points of damage. Unfortunately, Trahanakal is protected because yeah, when he draw up here, so he will, she will not go come through there because here we have the fog. Here we have the other hero that block line of sight. So unfortunately, he is protected. And the same is true for Era down there because here is clearly a pillar in the place. But still, those were eight points worth of damage, of course. They are being distributed between two heroes, but that's still huge. But unfortunately, the blue player forgot that the brilliant spell card is in play. So the green player can now decide to spend one of those tokens. And this prohibits any actions against an allied hero that requires line of sight. And this was clearly a thing, line of sight. So Ballisto doesn't take any damage points this round. And wow, this was really a downer, but at least there are three more wounds for Jael. Keep in mind, he still has this shield stone with him, but still he only has 10 life points and all of the heroes only have 10 life points. And whenever you have 10 or more wounds, your hero is removed from the game. And yeah, then you will only play with one of your heroes. But there is a great catch up mechanic in place, which pretty much allows you to flip your summary chart to the other si side once you are behind in respect to the amount of heroes you control. And then all of those actions get significantly cheaper. So really a great way to catch up with the other players. Also note that when half of the heroes are the Defeated, this will trigger the end of the game as well. So in a three player game, that's three heroes that need to be defeated. They can come from any players, but as soon as three heroes are down, this will yeah, basically trigger the end of the game. You always play to the end of the round, of course, but then it's pretty much game over. But the turn of Ellerin is not over, so she will move again. This costs her two action points. And I think, oof, I don't know, she wants to move. Oh, I don't know. I don't know. She wants to stay close to this magic space. So does it really make sense, to be honest? 
yeah why not let's move her here and before she ends her activation i think she's going to acquire an item and she can do that because she increased her magical power by one because of that magic stone if we now check the traveler's boots up there we see that we have two conditions this condition is basically a price token so this is something that you can actively pay in order to get the associated item so for example here she could get a wound, discard a magic card, discard a loot token and lose an action point. Not a big thing to be honest, so definitely something that you can think of doing. But on the other hand, here is something where you don't have to spend anything, you just have to have that. Though Those are the reward tokens and this is for magical power. She has plus one magical power in the first round, so those numbers here are the rounds and this is how much additional magical power you need to have in order to claim this item. In this case that's fully sufficient so this gets discarded she will be allowed to gain those traveler's boots which we attach to Alarin and you see we can attach up to three items here on the right hand side and those traveler's boots allow her to jump to any space that is within a line of sight but when she used this spell she gains two wounds. She can now directly use her crystal card this is here in order to upgrade those traveler's boots and I think this is what she wants to do so she has to spend or have to do one redeem action again there is this little icon here so we will flip it we will use the yeah, bottom activation here so this is now used and this allows her to flip those traveler's boots to the other side First of all, she can now jump to any space, so it doesn't have to be within line of sight. She still gets two wounds for that, but this can be pretty powerful. And this item is now worth a victory point by the end of the game. Pretty cool thing, but I think we call it a day. So let's place this on Ellerin. Let's reset all those counters. Good thing is she still has one action point left, which she can use at the start of the next round. Of course, we must not forget to reveal a new reward token. So this pretty much wow you can only claim that when you have 10 11 or 12 action points when you claim that Ooh, that's a pretty tough one to be honest well maybe not maybe not that's definitely something you can do you can always claim that at the start of your round for example but still 10 is definitely something and then we jump directly to era the basically the yellow player and era wants to move for free first movement is free keep in mind so she gets this I think stone of strength or so which she can attach to her character and her special ability allows her to shoot basically anyone that is let's say somehow trackled by a path so she does not need to have a line of sight she only needs to be able yeah to trace a path within the temple so she can basically reach anyone so here there's dinosite but she can move around here for example so she can hit Trahana Kalt. she doesn't want to hit her this is definitely not a problem Prince Argen up there she can definitely also reach Ellerin around this one but she will also be able to trace uh, let's say path to to Ballisto down there. But she feels that Ellerin is a pretty powerful character now. She has this plus one magical power, so that's already a three, which is pretty mighty, and the player doesn't have any room so far. So I think she wants to target Ellerin, and because she does now two points worth of damage, and of course we have to spend the action points, one, two, and three, this gives Ellerin two wounds. Ellerin's special ability is that she can heal herself or an ally and the more often she does it the better the healing effect is. So this is pretty pretty powerful but of course yeah she has to do that during her turn. She's out for this round so she cannot use it and I think she wants to do that again. So she will spend four action points one two three and four so she still has one more point left for the next round and so Ellerin takes additional two hits. She can still use her crystal card and I think she wants to do that. So let's do a redeem action. And I think she also wants to go for this loot action here. So let's flip this. Let's draw two tokens. First one, huh? it's talisman, allows you to upgrade an item. Can be okay, to be honest. And here 
we see an additional action magic stone. That's not too bad. So I think she wants to hold on to this stone, which she can attach to her character. And this gives her an additional action point. So I think now she wants to move again. So that's definitely not too bad. So she will spend one action point and still has one more point left for the next round. Of course, we have to discard this token and she will use her movement action to basically unblock this magnetic space so that new loot tokens can get spawned there at the start of the next round. Then it's the last activation for the green player and Ballisto is the only hero that is left and with his free movement basically he will move onto this magnetic space grabbing this protection stone which may help him doing one of the next rounds. Then I think he also wants to claim an item and he's going for that Sword of Kings. It's not particularly useful for him, but it can be useful for Trachanakal. So they may meet, but of course, if you upgrade, you still get a victory point. Victory points are pretty sparse in this game. That's for sure. Um, he wants to go for that price token there so he has to gain two wounds has to lose three of those um action points and has to discard a magic card i think this shouldn't be a problem at all so here are his two wounds he has to spend one two and three action points and he has to discard a magic card and i think we will go for this parry one here i think he doesn't really need it at this point in time and yeah that's good enough to claim the sword of kings and wow the armor of the light knights this is pretty cool because it helps you or makes the other players lose more action points when they do something that would affect you this can be pretty helpful but of course yeah that's the thing so we can discard this i think prize token let's reveal a new one you have to get rid of a loot token and have to spend five action points also not that bad to be honest so let's attach this sword of kings to ballisto for now unfortunately he cannot upgrade it right away because yeah his crystal card has already been used this round by drachanakal i believe he still has four more action points and i think he also wants to hit Ellerin now yeah i think this does make sense so he will spend three action points for that and this would give Ellerin an additional point of damage so she's half dead basically and also note that you get two victory points when you are the player who is defeating another hero and this is definitely huge as well then ballisto calls it a day as well he still has one more action point left for the next round so all of the players do actually and now we can resolve the end of round effects now we see which player which will player has taken the most wounds right now that's blue with five then it's four for yellow and only two for green and this will pretty much give the player order for the next round in this case this doesn't change so it's still blue yellow and green strange enough and the next thing you would do is to award victory points and you give the vic most victory points to the player with the least amount of wounds so in this case the green player gets one two three four victory points so you see that here then it's yellow with two victory points and only one victory point for the blue player then we advance into the next round of course and this player order thing is also a very nice catch-up mechanic to be honest so you make sure that the player who has let's say taken the most hits the last rounds or in total basically has a chance to get something very cool or maybe will be able to defeat another player first or something like that so this is definitely something i like a lot then we start basically the next round so we would flip over all of those crystal cards all of the players now get an additional magic card and again we see a pretty cool catch-up mechanic because the starting player gets to draw two cards and can choose one of those so pretty nice as well and again the starting player is the player who is beaten the most to be honest so in this case i think Windfist sounds like a pretty cool idea yeah why not you can do a lot of damage especially when you name yourself Alarin. And yeah, that's pretty much a full round of Magidix. You play that again until you reach the end of round six. If 
half of the heroes are defeated or if one of the players reached 15 victory points all of those triggers the end of the game at the end of the game you still do some end of game scoring so you get one victory point for every second loot token you possess and here also the loot tokens of defeated heroes counts of course you get a victory point for each of your upgraded items and here also the defeated heroes count and you get a victory point for each two remaining life points of your undefeated hero so in this case he still has six life points left so this would be three additional victory point and again the player who acquired the most amount of victory points is dominating the temple of Arthias Tam and yeah the winner of Magitix and yeah, this is how you play Magitix and I really hope you enjoyed my little walkthrough here. As mentioned, it's currently on Kickstarter, so definitely make sure you check out the campaign and yeah, of course, grab yourself a copy. If you're a friend of games with a high level of player interaction and yeah, mean little things you can do to the others, and I think this should be definitely on your list. It really shines with well-designed mechanics and yeah, offers really a great depth in respect to your tactical decisions, all of those magic cards, about the timing when you activate your heroes and so on. What I really liked is that even though it's a highly competitive game, it comes with pretty neat mechanisms that allows a player yeah, who, who fell behind to catch up with the others. It's subtle, but definitely works pretty, pretty well. It's more or less language independent, or pretty much fully language independent. Magitix comes with a lot of symbols. And because most of the components, or I think all of them, are unique, which is usually a very good thing, you have to refer to the various overviews more than just once. At first, you may be a little bit <laughs> overwhelmed by all those icons, which sometimes even disturb the artwork, for example, on those temple tiles or so on. But on the other side, it's pretty obvious what those bases do. So it can also be a good thing. But in the end, after a round or two, you start get behind things anyway. Apart from that, I absolutely enjoyed this game and of course still do. And yeah, hope to see you soon in one of my other videos. And until then, bye bye. <laughs>